Hi, thanks for joining me once again for the Pastor's Connection, going through the Word of God in the middle of our week to gain encouragement and insight from the beauty of the Scripture. We're in Psalm 139, and this is our kind of our final uh, uh, segment on that. We've been in it for two weeks now. Uh, a fantastic psalm, most known as a, a psalm that celebrates the sanctity of life, but really, as we've already discovered, it's a psalm that about how God protects all of his people, not just the unborn, but everyone that belongs to him. And uh, he does it by being who he is. And we've seen that this psalm breaks into three sections, and each section talks about a different attribute of God and how that attribute characterizes how he protects his people and stands for us. And the first section, verses 1 to 6, talked about God's omniscience and his knowledge being so wonderful that he knows everything about us, where we are, and what we think. And the practical aspect of that was that we, we know that God knows our need even before we bring it to him in prayer. So we have a God that cares for us as the omniscient God. And then the next sweep of scripture all the way to verse 18 was about how God cares with, for us rather by being everywhere, omnipresent as he is, everywhere in every dimension of our lives, there's no place we can hide from God, and there's no place that he cannot reach in his power and minister to us. So we're never out of the reach of God. We learned how to pray for those that might be out of our reach as people, but they're never out of the reach of the, the hand of God. Well, we finish up today by looking at the final part of the psalm. And uh, from all this language of praise and exalting God for his knowledge and his very present power, we go from the language of adoration to something that's pretty jarring. The whole psalm takes a turn at the end, and David, the psalm writer, goes from praise to praying that God would slay the wicked. It's a big turn. Verse 19, oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God, exclamation point. And he goes on to talk about how he hates the wickedness that those that hate God perform, and he wants God to deal with them. And it's a pretty jarring set of scripture, and you, you might wonder, wow, how does that fit in? And Well, we can talk about that today, because obviously the, the element of God's person that he's talking about there is his omnipotence, because he's calling God to deal with sinful people everywhere and to bring them to an end. So he's praying for that. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. So how do we put that together, and how do we adjust that in our hearts uh, well, let's do what we always do. We take a look at the passage briefly, then we'll draw a principle out of it and go into the practical as we wrap it up. The passage, uh, Psalm 139, verse 19, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. He declares that as a, as a prayer to God. And he gets even more direct in verse 22 by saying that he actually hates the wicked with a complete hatred, and he counts them as his enemies. Now, David a man of God, a child of God, a man with a righteous heart and a high level of character is writing this. And so it's jarring, but it's also, when you think about it, logical. What do I mean by that? Well, listen, if you, like David, love God, then you're going to love what God loves. And listen, you're going to hate what God hates. Isn't that true in your life? Now that you've come to know Christ, now that you've come to know the, the price that he paid for your sin, now that you've come to know the beauty of his holiness and what he really wants that pleases him, now that you've come to know a little bit of what sin actually did in your life and through you to others, don't you have a love relationship with God and a growing hate relationship with sin? You should. Romans 6 tells us that that's a transformation that should take place in us. We should begin to hate sin and want to crucify it. So if you love God, then you will love what he loves, obedience, righteousness, holiness, goodness, love, but you'll also hate what he hates. And by transference, this might be hard to hear, you'll also hate those that do the things that God hates. You're going to take on a level of righteousness. In fact, I wouldn't understand the, the greatness of God's love if I also didn't understand the greatness of my jealousy for his love. In other words, if, if I have a godly love for God, I'm going to have a godly jealousy for him to be honored in every part of life. And sin dishonors him. 
wickedness dishonors him. And so, if I love God, I am going to hate wickedness. And so I should be able to pray, or pray, pray, pray like David did. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Oh, that, that you would deal with all those that hate you. And that ultimately, Lord, that you would deal with sin itself. I want sin to be ended and eradicated. In fact, it, it, it moves logically through the passage in another way. If God does know everything, he knows everything that happens on the planet. If God is everywhere at once, he's also present in the midst of all the wickedness and the evil things that happen each and every moment all over the world. If that's true, but he's also a, a holy and righteous and loving and just God, it would follow that if he sees all these things and is present with all these things, then he ought to be doing something about it. Isn't that true? Isn't that a prayer that rises in your soul when you see wickedness all over the world? You see it rising today, just as 2 Timothy 3 said it would in the last days. Don't you want to pray to God to end the wickedness that we see just pulsing throughout the world? I hope so. That's a godly prayer. So all of this, though, is balanced in another way. And this is where I wanted to take you right to the end of the psalm. He does pray in verse 19 that God would slay the wicked. He does say in verse 22 that he hates those that, that do wickedness with a complete hatred. They're enemies of God. But then look how he ends it. Verse 23, and this may be familiar to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. What does this teach us? It teaches us that our hatred of sin and our prayer for God to deal with it needs to be balanced by humble self-reflection about our own sin. Yes, we're redeemed. Yes, we belong to God now. Yes, our sin was taken to the cross. But we still have the, the flesh that remains. We still tumble into sin ourselves as believers. And when we pray against sin, we also need to ask God to search our own hearts over our own sin. So there's kind of a moral balancing act, if you will, that, that should accompany every prayer for God to judge sin in others and in the world should be accompanied by what David closes with, humble self-reflection for God to chastise and deal with sin in my own heart as a believer. It's an amazing psalm, isn't it? Only the word of God can speak this righteously, but this pointedly. Only the word of God. So that's the passage. What's a principle we can take out of it? Here's how I put it in words. It's right for us to hate wickedness and want to see it dealt with. And that should include our own hearts. It's right for us to hate wickedness and want to see it dealt with in the world and in those around us that live in sin and harm others. But it should include our own hearts. That's the moral balance that allows us to pray righteously, but also to want to live righteously. So what's a practical point that you can take out of this today? Well, when you see things happening around us, when you see amplified in the world today, sin and escalating form all around us, don't just be saddened by sin. Actively pray for its end. It's okay to pray a prayer like David prayed. It's okay to be angry with sin as you see it in the world and in the lives of those you care about. It's okay to want God to deal with it, but also ultimately to want God to end it and, and send it to hell where it belongs. It's okay to pray for God to bring sin to an end and judge it and end it. In fact, I've got a suggested prayer for you. It's a one-phrase prayer that Jesus taught us generations ago. He said, pray this way, Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is not only a prayer for the king to come, it's a prayer for sin to be ended. Father, let thy will be done on earth, this wicked, broken earth. Let this earth be cleansed of sin, cleansed of unrighteousness, cleansed of those that don't want to obey you and love you. Let it be judged and final here, so that as in heaven your will is perfect now, let it be perfect 
on the earth in the future. That's the, the heaven and earth that I look forward to. It's going to be remade just for you and me as believers. And the Bible says that there will be no sorrow because there will be no sin there at all. Good prayer to pray. Good moment to long for. Thanks for being with me. God bless you in your day. Lord willing, we'll connect next time.